I see Mick hit the ropes and I blink my eye and Mick's gone. He's disappeared. Like he's just like <laughs> abracadabra. He's not there. And a split, a, a millionth of a second later, I hear, <laughs> but, and, and just instinctively reacted to it. You know, like something went by my head. <laughs> The ring for Barely Legal, it seems to me a brand new ring. It's got its completely unique sound to it. It's got a big clattering sound to it. Um, it makes a great impactful noise, but it also looked quite bouncy. Uh, I don't know if you remember this particular ring or if you noticed him while you were watching Barely Legal eight days ago, yeah. as we wink, yeah. as we were called. Yeah, this. yeah. The, uh, the, the rings, as I recall, the, the, the newer rings that would become the ECW ring, they were made on a by a company out in Long Island. Prior to that, there were one or two different rings. Like it, it might be a different ring from the last arena show, uh, and it was quite hard. But on the show that night, you can't tell because of all the people. The days before, the days leading up to the pay per view, the entire ECW crew was in there sweeping the floors, painting, covering, you know, getting the building up to snuff, so it didn't quite look as bingo hollish as it had prior and the ring being brand new uh the it, the ecw ring that 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 we'll say this ring moving forward excuse me i apologize hmm. my morning coffee from last from eight days ago uh <laughs> it uh uh they uh it, it was a great ring to work in uh, really really uh safe uh the, the this ring had it was the first time I'd ever worked in a ring outside of one of the big companies that the 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 subfloor, which is plywood, actually had each of the cross plates on. I keep um, sooner or later I'll get used to this whole setup. No, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. But are we still in pl good place here? Can you? Oh yeah, yeah, well? yeah. You're fine. You carry on. The uh, the subfloor. The, the first of all, there was a rim around the edge that would hold. You know, so if you capital if you enlarged it. The piece of plywood sort of sat in like this, so it wouldn't fly out and pop up. Com additionally, in each of the corners, there were cross plates on the under uh, girding of, of the rings, all steel suspension. Rings prior to that had uh, uh, like a, a railroad spring or some big spring in the middle. These were what's called a suspension ring, where which probably is the reason for the more of the, the bouncy look, uh, where those plywoods would then lay down, and where they met, there was an iron plate underneath that had screw holes cut through and we would take a flathead nut and roll it down through so that entire subfloor was bolted down so the boards couldn't pop out like it happened so often in and in, say independent rings or smaller promotions it also had the half inch of uh of what it would be termed for la lack of better uh word or maybe there's an official word for it it was a foam padding sort of like a carpet padding that was a half inch thick uh, the fans, when they ever get to feel the ring, they'll say, oh, I thought it was a lot softer than that. Um, and, or, you know, or, or they ask about like the bounce of the ring. They, in their heads, a lot of fans think it's sort of like a trampoline type of thing. And really, it's not. It, it, the reason it's not, and the reason that it doesn't have six inches of padding on it, is when we're running, if you look at the bottom of a wrestling boot, I wish I had one here, uh, they're smooth. There's no tread on it. So if you know, when, if you've ever been to an outdoor show and it starts to rain, you see while well, the wrestlers are on ice skates. That's why because they have no tread on their on their on the bottom. The reason for that is so that we can glide along the ring. So that as we're running the ropes or whatever, that we have we like our, our the, the, there's no traction that say catches and and like if you want to twist and turn, you could blow your knee out. Uh, it's the, 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 everything that is in a wrestling ring today is there for a reason. The way it's set up, like it's set up, the way that there's the give. Not so much in ECW was being Land of the Giants, but when you go like say like imagine WWE with a Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant or you know four of these monsters in the ring, you start taking bumps. Especially remember like the bump that uh uh that Chris uh uh, uh got again with the names uh <laughs> wrestling Hulk Hogan uh King Kong Bundy uh, and you know taking that huge bump off the top of the cage. If that were just a solidly welded ring pretty likely some of those welds are going to break you know because metal doesn't give and it doesn't flex so the the reason the ring has that little bit of the give is so that it doesn't break on the welds and things like that especially through the course of night how many bumps and how many big guys take falls in the ring and everything else so that ring i believe was built at a company out on long island near where the house of hardcore was the, the, the ecw training center 
And Mikey was the conduit to that for some reason. Um, so like when I got the house of hardcore two in Pittsburgh, Mikey was who delivered the ring. And it was the exact same ring as that was used in the arena or the house shows, uh, later for ECW, a fantastic ring. And I think now, uh, the, the house of hardcore two ring is, is, uh, owned by one of the promoters out near in, in the, uh, uh, Lank, not Lancaster, uh, in the outskirts of Philadelphia area. Um, and I'm sure there's still plenty of them floating around because there were four or five of them all together, I think. They were then, I think, $6,000 per ring. And, and, you know, that was an expensive ring in 1997. So uh, I think if you look at that, you can see that in, in, in whatever way ECW could in preparing for this launch on pay-per-view, we were trying to get it as much up to snuff as we could with the professional the professional look of the building as much as possible, the brand new ring. And to want to give the impression that this is, yes, this is still ECW. We're still in the same building. These are still the same wrestlers, but we're upgraded a bit. It's ECW 2.0. Uh, leaving ECW out of it, let's just go for the uh, main territories or promotions you work for. Who had the best ring? Who had the worst? And why? I'd say the ECW ring. Uh, the NWA, I used to love their ring. The problem with it was, they had, if you go back and watch the old NWA tapes, when people hit the ring, the ropes, you'll hear this clack, 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 yeah. clack sound. Uh, that's because they had a piece of like rubber tubing over a cable. Vince McMahon, WWE has always used the real ropes. Um, well, well, that I actually am, leads me to that. Do you prefer cable or real ropes? Cable. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why. I was just going to tell say that. Uh, uh, several instances. First of all, the ropes have a lot more sponginess to them. Not that they're loose. But when you hit a real rope, it can, you know, you sort of go and go and go before you get the bounce back. The cable much less gifts you come. It gives you a lot more uh, momentum in shooting you off the off the rope, uh, off the cable in that, uh, in that instant. Uh, early in our career, Dominic had us up in uh, upstate New York. And I, as I recall, it was me and Dominic versus, I think, Dave Klebanski and Mick Foley. And uh, they're in the ring crisscrossing. And I'm watching Mick. You know, as he's going side to side, and you know, like when you're when you're seeing two guys crisscross, you're sort of like look, your focus is going to center ring, and so your peripheral vision is catching them hitting the ropes. I see Mick hit the ropes, and I blink my eye, and Mick's gone. He's disappeared, like he's just like <laughs> abracadabra. He's not there. And a split, a, a millionth of a second later, I hear, but <laughs> and and just instinctively reacted to it. You know, like something went by my head. What had happened was that rope, it was an actual rope ring. Uh, when Mick hit the rope, the rope, the turnbuckle itself had let loose the threads. And so that turnbuckle is what, again, went slot flying by my head. Had it been another inch or so, but it, but it killed me. Uh, but Mick, because of the way Dominic had taught us to hit the ropes, you know, the first thing he did, his body instinctively tightened up and that locked the rope under his arm and allowed his body to pivot and he hit. Otherwise, he'd hit on the top of his head. When you see something that happened, it happened so quickly and could have been so catastrophic that that leaves an indelible mark that you don't quite easily forget about. And so, like, when I was in the WWF working in those rings, there was always an apprehension in hitting those ropes that would the threads let loose? Would the rope let go? Typically, no, because, you know, pretty much they're changing those ropes pretty often. It's fresh rope uh, that, that's underneath there you know, with tape over it. Uh, at least the rings that I used to work for. I don't know what they have now. I haven't been there for years. Uh, but the cable, the, the the clattering sound, but there's a little bit more danger to that because back in the day when I, my knees were still good, I used to do what, you know, you have the heel beat on me, turnbuckle and shoot me. I would vault to the top turnbuckle into a blind cross body block. One particular night, I think we were in, it was either the Omni in Atlanta or, or building close by. Uh, we were working Midnight Express and Bobby Eaton shot me, and I went to do that. Well, when my foot hit the top rope instead, like the hit the corner of the turnbuckle, but the top rope, that plastic like, spun, and so my foot just like shot straight through. And I, again, I'm gonna get used to this. I have people at home, so I don't keep on kicking things. But uh, and you know, and boom, and I'm upside down landing the ropes. So there was a you know, there's no way to really plan for that. Like you can't say, okay, how can I safeguard against that? Uh, sometimes they spun, other times they might be taped and not spin. So it was a crapshoot. And that clacking sound that would that you get from off the ring, I, I never was fond of. The smaller territories, like I said earlier, the boards would often come loose. A lot of times they're like uh, two by 12s that lay next to each other. And when one of those comes up and hits you in the head, it can be dangerous. Mm. 
also when you're running the ropes, as those things are bouncing, when you're subconsciously, again, I can touch my nose without even thinking about it because we've done it 10 million times, right? It's called proprioceptors in your arm. When you're running the ropes, the same thing. Your body knows exactly where your toe is going to hit and where you're going to take your next step and, and keep running, keep the momentum going. If the ring is going like this or the boards are going like this, your brain thinks that you're hitting floor. And if it's a second, you know, an inch or two below that, and then it comes up and meets, it could blow your knee ligaments out, can you know break your leg, break a bone. Uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in the ring. So that said, I, again, I think the ECW rings that that would become the ring that would become the ECW ring from barely legal forward were incredibly professional rings. Uh, the sound was different from previous. But if you look at the later tapes in, in ECW, and part of the most iconic matches you remember watching in ECW, it has that sort of same feel and sound.